Good morning, Grace Church. It's good to be with you all. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 40. There's a tad bit of grape juice that I'm going to clean up real quick. All right, we got it. All right, open up to Genesis chapter 40. If you looked ahead on the service guide, you probably realized that we're covering two chapters this morning, which is a little ambitious given what we normally do, but don't worry, I promise to have you all out by dinner time, so we'll, we'll get through this. The reason for that, though, is that I, I do believe Genesis chapter 40 and Genesis chapter 41 is all one connected unit, and so uh, I, I felt it unhelpful to preach one without preaching both chapters this morning. And as we jump in, I'm going to pray now and just ask God for his help. Father, we are thankful for your kindness. Uh, God, even as David just said, you are a God who, who gives abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. You, you always do abundantly more than we ask or imagine. And we know you're a God who speaks and you're a God who provides for us and you've given us your word and you want to build us up through it. And so my prayer is that you would fill me with your spirit and fill these hearers with your spirit that we all might ascertain and understand the glories of Christ and the wonders of who you are, your character, and what you're doing even in the midst of uh, troubling and painful circumstances that we're dealing with this morning. We need your help and we need your Holy Spirit and we're asking for that now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, one of the privileges I have as, as one of the pastors here is to sit in, in membership interviews. Uh, we, every person that, that joins the church, we have a membership interview in which we get to just talk about their testimony and, and how they came to personally follow the Lord. And as I sit in those interviews, it is rare to listen to anybody's story, especially seasoned saints, saints who've been around the block a few times, it's rare to listen to any story that does not include some degree of, of suffering, sometimes intense suffering. If you live long enough, you will suffer. Some of you are probably in that season right now. It may have been a while. Some of you are maybe coming out of it and you feel like God is really giving you grace to, to heal you and, and to bring you through. And, and some of you, don't know it yet, but, but you might be in for some suffering uh, down the road. But all of us will face suffering at some point because it's inevitable in the sin-cursed world that we find ourselves in. And when suffering comes, it, it is the arena in which our theology is put to the test. Suffering is the place where our, our, all the stuff we've learned in books and, and all of that, it, it, the rubber hits the road. And then we have to decide what we really believe about God. Most of us, when suffering comes, we're tempted to believe God has abandoned me or God is not good. God does not care. God is not powerful enough to deal with all of these things in my life. Or we think I've done something wrong and now God is punishing me. There's even an idea uh, that really got popular probably about 20 years ago. It's, it's called open theism. And it's the idea that God doesn't know the future. And so suffering surprises God just as, as much as it surprises you, that he's unaware, he's caught off guard just in the same way that, that you are. If you don't have what I call a big God theology, then you will not be able to handle suffering with any degree of hope. If your understanding of God is not high and exalted and, and you see him as all powerful and sovereign over every instance in the universe, then you will not be able to handle suffering with any degree of hope. And so the focus of our sermon today is on a doctrine called providence, the doctrine of God's providence. If you want a very basic de definition of providence, it's this. And no, I'm not talking about the city in Rhode Island. Providence is the working of God's power to uphold, to guide, and to care for his creation. God's providence is the working of his power to uphold, to guide, and to care for his creation. 
In other words, it's, it's God's sovereign control put in purposeful action. That God is directing every event in the universe from the smallest little detail of your life to the movement of galaxies. He's directing all of it to its appointed end, which is his glory and your good. Listen to Ephesians 1.11. Paul He's talking about God's electing purposes. And he says, in him, we have an atta- obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, all things according to the counsel of his will. And so the goal of this sermon today, as we think about God's providence, the goal is not for you to get in the mind of God and to understand exactly what he's doing in your life or what he might be doing in the future. The goal is to see God, who's, who his ways are higher than our ways, his mind, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Our goal is to see God as trustworthy so that in our pain, we know that it's not wasted that it's not meaningless, that it's not purposeless, purposeless. God has given us examples in scripture to show us just the way he works in order to, to build our faith and to see that this God can be trusted with your very life. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no greater example in scripture of the providence of God than Joseph's life. There is no greater example. And so as we look at his life today, The title of our sermon is this, if you're taking notes, God's providence in the pit. God's providence in the pit. I have no doubt this morning that some of you here are in a pit. And in scripture, the pit is often described as as a place of death, a place of mourning, a place of sorrow and sadness. And some of you may even feel that this morning. You may feel like that's where you are. You're, You're at the brink. And you need to hear from God and you need to know that God is in complete control of every event in your life. I can promise you that. And so as we look at Joseph's life, the first thing we're gonna see is this. He will guide you with his word. He will, God will guide you with his word. Look at chapter 40, verse one. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. And they continued for some time in custody. Well, you'll recall from the last chapter that Joseph is now a prisoner. He's, he's a prisoner in the king's uh, prison. Over the course of, of the last many years of his life, he's gone from being sold into slavery by his brothers to put in uh, basically servitude in Potiphar's house. And now after a false accusation, he sits in prison. And time is trickling away for Joseph at this point. It's been 11 years since he was sold into slavery at this point. He's 28 years old now. He was sold into slavery as a 17-year-old. 11 years of suffering. 11 years since Joseph had been a free man. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot of time for bitterness to creep in. A lot of time to get angry at God. A lot of time to question God's faithfulness and God's goodness, especially given the fact that Joseph had been told he was gonna reign And people were going to bow down to him. And here this man sits in a prison cell in a foreign land, away from his family and seemingly away from God. But we don't see any cursing from Joseph. We don't see any shaking of the fist. We don't see any uh, anger or any uh, jealousy of of what others are, are, are their lot and and his not being as good. We don't see any of that in Joseph's life. Instead, we see Joseph's faithfulness. He had to have been trusted because he's put, he's assigned to two very important men. And that's that's showing Joseph was a faithful man in prison. He was somebody that that these 
uh, prison guards could look at and say, I can trust this man to attend to these other men. In fact, in a little while, we're going to see the way Joseph, instead of wallowing in self-pity, he attends to the concerns of others. Ask, why are you troubled? What, why are you sad? What, how can I help you? Joseph is faithfully trusting God and is not wallowing in a pity party. And he meets two men, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. Now, why are these men put in prison? Well, it depends on their, their role, what, what they do for the king. You'll recall from the book of Nehemiah what a cupbearer is, if you remember Nehemiah's story. This is somebody who, who tastes the king's food, who tastes the king's drink before he, he partakes so that the king doesn't unknowingly poison himself. Basically, the cupbearer is a trusted man who, who weeds out any potential uh, assassination attempts on the king. Same goes for the baker, the man who prepares the king's food from the supply chain to the ingredients and everything in between to, to, to the point that it, do, it sits on the king's table. You got two trusted men here. And so what's probably going on here is that there's been an assassina assassination attempt on the Pharaoh and he has put these men in prison probably while he investigates. Well, Joseph meets these two men and little does he know at the time, but God will use these encounters to very soon put Joseph before the king of Egypt. So look at verse five. One night they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Now, I don't know about you, but I rarely remember my dreams. And if I do, I see absolutely no significance to them whatsoever. I mean, I forget them by like three seconds after I, I wake up. But this is not the case for, for the ancient world. Dreams were incredibly important. They were believed to be the way that, that God spoke to people. And remember, this is before God has any written revelation right now. And so you see that God does speak to people in the book of Genesis through dreams. He speaks to people like Jacob through a dream. Recall that, that Jacob saw the dream of, of the angels descending and ascending on this ladder at Bethel. He speaks to Joseph in dreams. Later, he'll speak to foreign kings in dreams. Think of Nebuchadnezzar. And he has another man, Daniel, there to interpret. Even Jesus's, you could say, earthly father, Mary's husband, Joseph, God speaks to Joseph in a dream about the coming Messiah. And so dreams are incredibly important. They communicate something about God. God is revealing something to man. Yet, without an interpreter, somebody to decode these dreams, it's worthless. It's like somebody sitting across a, a, a table from you speaking a foreign language and you have no idea what they're saying. It, without an interpreter, the dream means nothing. Normally, the Egyptians would call on wise men magicians to come and int interpret these dreams. And they'd, they'd look at the, the, the skies and the constellations and they'd try to figure out what these dreams meant. But they have none of this here in prison. Little, do the, little does the baker and the cupbearer know that they have a wise man with them in prison. And so here, Joseph is gonna come to them and say, what's going on? Why are you troubled? And they say, we have, we've had these dreams. And notice what Joseph says. Look at it. Do not interpretations belong to God. This is very important for the next couple chapters. Do not interpretations belong to God. Joseph is so in tune with the voice of God that it's just second nature for him to assume, hey, God's speaking right now. God is revealing something to you right now. They don't need magicians. They don't need wise men of Egypt. 
They need someone who knows God personally to deliver God's personal message to them. And that's what Joseph will do. And don't miss this. Joseph right now is in a pit. I mean, he, this prison cell, this place where he, where he is, it is his pit. It is a, a dark place. It's hard. But Joseph has something that no free man within 100 miles of him has. He has the word of God. This will sustain him. This word will guide him. This word will fuel his faith in the pit. And it will, it will sustain his faithfulness to endure in the pit as long as God would have him there. The same is true for you. Some of you are in a pit this morning. It's terrible and it's dark and you're so disoriented, you don't know which way is up from down. And you need to understand that you have in the same way that in, the, in prison, Joseph had the light of God's revelation for him. You have the light of God's word. Psalm 119 is what the lady just spent a whole retreat on. Your word is a lamp to my feet. It is a light to my path. That implies darkness. When darkness surrounds me, your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is so for Joseph in prison. This is the guiding. This is the guiding light for Joseph as he sits in a prison cell. God illuminates the darkness with his word. And so Joseph, even in prison, served a God who speaks. And because of it, Joseph listened and he communicated to the king's servants. Look at verse nine. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, the blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. This is really, really fast growth here. The Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. The baker sees a very favorable interpretation for the cupbearer and he says, oh, my turn. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head and in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. You, you sure you're ready for it? The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So both of these men share their dreams with, with Joseph and they give, they give a lot of details here and they, they share these dreams and each dream seems to correspond to the kind of work that these men did for Pharaoh. And you might be sitting here thinking, boy, I'm pretty sure I could interpret at least one of those dreams. It's not that difficult to interpret. Just understand, it seems very difficult for the men in, in the narrative to, to understand this. They don't get it. They, this is not immediately evident what's going to happen, but Joseph comes along and brings the light of God's revelation to them. His interpretation is that the cut, cut bear, you're gonna be restored. You're gonna be restored to your position. Probably it means an investigation is gonna to come to its completion and you're gonna be found not guilty by, by the king. And Joseph really sees this as an opportunity. 
What does he say to the cupbearer? Hey, hey listen, you're going to get out of here in just a matter of days. Man, remember me. When you get out of here, just remember me. Put in a good word before the king. Tell him I'm innocent. I haven't done anything wrong. And cupbearer's probably like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that when, when I get out of there. I, I think we actually can learn something from Joseph in this, that it is not wrong to desire to be out of difficult circumstances. Not wrong. I, I think sometimes we, we get confused and we believe, well, I gotta like, I gotta be in this really hard place with a fake smile on my face the whole time. I, that's not true. You can actually want to be out of the situation. You can want that. Think of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there's any other way for you to secure the redemption of mankind besides me having to go to a cross and die, now would be a good time to let me know. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. The real question is whether you will be content, whether Joseph will be content to hear the words, no, or to hear the words, wait in this situation, if it doesn't come to pass. And so Joseph, he's gonna ask this man to remember him and that's gonna, make, that's gonna be a key development as the narrative continues. The baker obviously is not so lucky. This man, yes, his head will be raised up, but it, it will not be in a good way. Joseph says, your head's gonna be raised up. You're gonna be hung on a tree. Literally, you're going to be impaled on a tree, most likely for treason, for conspiracy against the king. Why does the author go into all this detail about the dreams? I mean, if you think about these two chapters, there is so much detail about these dreams. Why does he mention so much of it? I mean, why talk about grapes and blossoms and clusters and bur Why talk about all that? I believe it has to do with the last few words of verse 22. Look at those words. But he hanged the chief baker, what? As Joseph had interpreted to them. As Joseph had interpreted to them. The point is that reality is happening exactly as Joseph said it would. And this is not to credit Joseph. In fact, he won't take any credit. This is to credit God who is revealing the events that will soon take place. Again, God's revelation is forging the path that will soon lead Joseph out of a prison cell. It is only because God is giving light in this prison that Joseph will ever be able to get out of this prison because what he's able to do with these two men will be remembered in a couple of years and it will bring Joseph out of the pit standing before the king of Egypt. And so as, as we think about this, how do we apply a passage like this to our lives? Does this mean that you and I should wake up every morning and write down our dreams and start asking God what they mean? I, I don't think so. I'm not saying, listen, God can do whatever he wants. And if God wants to speak through dreams, he is more than capable of doing that. But don't you understand that we have something so much better than dreams? We have the word of God, the complete, sufficient revelation of God. The word that is sufficient to guide you through any storm that you face in life. You don't have to look in the stars and figure out the constellations or look at your horoscope or ask God to speak to you in dreams. He has given you in his word, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Scripture says he's given us these very great and precious promises, very great and very precious promises. And those, those guide us as we're in the pit when it seems like there's darkness all around those promises, that revelation from God is the guide. And some of you, you're in a season of great darkness and honestly, you're flailing and you haven't picked up your Bible in months or weeks, I, years. And you wonder like, why do I have no peace? Well, I, I'm, and also I'm not saying scripture is a magic pill that just fixes everything. 
These, these promises in scripture have to be believed by faith. But as you take these promises by faith, you, your view of God becomes bigger. Your understanding of the problems in front, front of you become smaller. They don't disappear. They become smaller. And you're able to see with God's perspective instead of your own myopic and often sin-coded perspective. You have more access to God than Joseph did. Some of you probably sit here and think, man, it'd be nice for God to speak to me in some dreams. That would be really helpful right now. I think if Joseph were standing here in this congregation preaching to you, he'd say, I am jealous of you. You get the whole counsel of God. You get it all. I want what you have. You get Jesus. I didn't get Jesus. You get Jesus. Don't... Don't take this as a, let's start looking for how God's speaking to us in dreams. Take it as God has given you his revelation, his full, totally sufficient word to be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path in dark places. His word will guide you in the pit. Well, Joseph thought for sure that the cupbearer would return the favor, put in a good word with Pharaoh, but he was ultimately met with disappointment. Look at verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. 11 years. 11 years of captivity for Joseph at this point. I mean, that, that is, that's a, about a third of his life at this point has been spent in some form of captivity. And here's his opportunity. Here's his golden chance. Here's the guy who can get me out. What does he do? Forgets him. Forgets all about him. Uses him. Gets, gets his, what he wanted. Forgets Joseph. But Joseph's future was not dependent on the fickle memory of a finite man. It was dependent on the providence of his sovereign God who loved him and cared for him. And even if man had forgotten him temporarily, God had not. And the same is true for you. And that's our second point for this morning. He will never forget you. God will never forget you. If you are in Christ, God will not forget you as Joseph was forgotten by this man. Look at chapter 41, verse one. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep again and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. And a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted it to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. God's people have always been awaiting people. You think about Noah waiting for years and years for it to rain, probably being mocked at by all the surrounding culture. You think of Abraham waiting years and years for a promised son, 
You think of Jacob waiting years and years in Laban's household on his farm, waiting for the time that he could be released to go back home. And now Joseph waiting and waiting and waiting. And the temptation in the waiting is to believe that God has forgotten me. He's off tending to other business. He has more important matters and, and it shows I, was, I wasn't really the apple of his eye. He never really cared about me. When this happens, we, we might fight for control of the situation. Some of us become anxious, sinfully so. Some of us fear and despair. Some of us just outright curse God. And again, these are the moments when our theology is put to the test. In the waiting, we have to ask, what do I really believe about God? Either he's in control of my circumstance or he's not. There's no in between. If he's not in control, then all I can trust is coincidence and chance and hope that somehow fate works out, which it won't. Or I can believe God is in control and I can submit myself to his fatherly, tender care for me and trust his track record of past faithfulness will guide me through the future. It doesn't mean that we enjoy the circumstance we're in, but it does mean we entrust ourselves to his wise and sovereign hand, knowing that he is infinitely wiser. He sees beginning to end. He has, he has the whole perspective. And I just get one little myopic point of view. Listen to Lamentations 3, 25 and 26. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. What sometimes is difficult to accept is when salvation does not come on our timetable. Sometimes salvation, at least physically, doesn't even come in this life. But God is no less good or no less compassionate because in our waiting, God is assuredly working. Listen to Isaiah 64, four. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts, who acts for those who wait for him. That is what God did with Joseph. That is exactly what God did with Joseph. While Joseph was waiting and trusting and submitting himself to the Lord day after day after day, God was working. We know this because it is not a mere coincidence that Pharaoh has a troubling dream. There's no coincidences in this narrative. God puts this dream in Pharaoh's mind and he was using it as a means to get David out of prison. It wasn't until Pharaoh and his cupbearer witnessed the failure of all the wise men, all the supposed wise men, of all the magicians of Egypt, that finally, finally the cupbearer remembered, oh, dad, there was a guy in prison and he interpreted, or interpreted my dreams and it came to pass exactly as he said it would. And so finally, after 13 years, 13 years, God brought Joseph out of the pit and his rise, his exaltation was beginning at this very moment. God remembered Joseph. When man forgot, God remembered. It's how he always works. This is who he is in his nature. We use the term Yahweh to, to that, that's the name that, that God reveals himself as. It, it, it holds this idea of, of covenant faithfulness, of, of steadfast love, Meaning when God revealed himself to Moses, he said, I'm a covenant keeping God. I'm a God who has steadfast love. Meaning I won't forget you. You may think at times that I've forgotten, that I've walked away, that I'm tending other business, but I have not forgotten you. I will never forget you. This is the heart of God's character to be a covenant keeper, a faithful God to his people. He can't break his promises. It's not in his nature to. And because of that, it leads us to our third point, which is this. God will not waste your pain. God will not waste your pain. 
Look now as we continue in verse 14. When Joseph had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. And I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten him, eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. And then I awoke. And I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. For the third time now in Joseph's life, his God-given ability to interpret dreams is going to play a very crucial role in the development of redemptive history. All Pharaoh, all Pharaoh knows of Joseph is that this man is gifted. He has a very unique ability that nobody in the land of Egypt has. But notice Joseph in verse 16, he doesn't take credit for this gift. He credits God. It's not in me, Joseph says, but God will give Pharaoh a favorable interpretation. This is really, this is a model of, of how to use your gifts for God's glory. It's every time, every time somebody says, man, the, the way you're so hospitable, that's, ama that's an amazing quality. Well, honestly, it's not in me. God gives me that grace to do that. Or man, you, you have the gift of teaching and you're such a good counselor. It's not in me. God gives me that ability. I, I can take no glory for this. I'm just trying to be an instrument in God's hands used by him. So God does show Joseph what will soon take place. Look at verse 25. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that come up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them will arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt." The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of that famine that will follow for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming up and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish under famine." Now here's, there's a lot we could talk about here, but here's what I don't want you to miss. The complete control of God over these entire events that are about to come to pass. The complete control of God over every event that is about to come to pass. Look at verse 25. God has revealed what he is about to do. Or verse 28. God has shown what he is about to do. Or verse 32, this thing is fixed by God. He will bring it about. There is nothing happening in this narrative that is not under the sovereign control of God. In fact, God is ordaining that these events come to pass. There's nothing 
Nothing in the world that happens outside of God's control. Not Hamas sending rockets into Israel. Not your child getting sick and even possibly dying. Not your parents getting cancer, getting dementia and losing their memory of even you. There is nothing that happens in your life that is not under the sovereign control of God. He is in control of every event, of every circumstance. He's in control of plenty and he is in control of famine. And he has promised that he is about to bring it about. No chance, no coincidence, but God's providential governing of every event down to the molecular level. So what's gonna happen in Egypt? They're gonna have seven years of plenty, seven years of abundance, but then seven years of such a severe famine that it'll, it'll be as if they never had any good years in the first place. This would be devastating for a culture dependent upon rain and crops. You and I don't understand what this is like. We, we, we go to the grocery store and unless it's COVID in 2020 and you need toilet paper, pretty much what you want is there. You don't have to wonder what, whether the shelves are gonna be stocked. These people are gonna face severe famine where they don't know where their next meal is gonna come from. And that means, that means death, certain death for all involved. And so this is gonna be a devastating famine that's gonna sweep across the land. And God has revealed this. But in the midst of this revelation, in the midst of this revelation, God will declare a plan of salvation. Do you see it? What's the plan? Well, number one, find a wise man you need to find an administrator, a wise man who can carry out this plan. Number two, you need to appoint some people under him who can, who can help him execute it. You need to stock up 20% of all the food that is grown during the years of plenty. And then you need to put in, in cities all over the land where people can have quick, easy access to them when the famine comes. So God's, God's showing Pharaoh, hey, it, bad things are coming but there's a way out if you will but listen to me. So the question is, will Pharaoh listen? Will he heed the warning and listen to God's plan of salvation? Look at verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in gar garments of fine linen and put a gold chain, gold chain around his neck and he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, that being Joseph, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Joseph said, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or a foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonoth Pania and he gave him in marriage Asenath the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt and put the food in cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it, and Joseph stored up the grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he ceased to measure it for it could not be measured. Well, Joseph probably didn't realize it when he was talking to Pharaoh that he was interviewing for the job, but Pharaoh puts him in this position, second in command over all of Egypt. The clear recognition that God is with this man Right? And Pharaoh is probably not a Yahweh worshiper. He probably understands that there's many gods, but he understands something unique about this one man. And he says, the spirit of God is in this man. 
Here is Joseph's rise to power. For 13 years, his life, had seeming, his life had seemingly gone off the rails. And yet in a matter of days, he would rise from pit to palace. They throw a parade for him. Everybody bow the knee. He gives him uh, an Egyptian wife. The Bible makes no comment over whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. We've been saying in our series of Genesis, it is not a good thing to marry foreign wives who serve foreign gods. I will say for Joseph, he never wavers on his faithfulness to Yahweh, his God. I'm not gonna comment on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but Joseph stays true to his God. We're born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of... We're born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Do you catch what's happening again? The seven years of abundance happened exactly as Joseph had said to Pharaoh. The seven years of famine happened exactly as Joseph said to Pharaoh. Everything God had revealed that, would ha that was going to happen happened exactly as he had revealed it. God's in complete control. Famine spreads over all Egypt, not only over all Egypt, but over all the earth. But there's more than enough food in Egypt, more than enough. You want bread? Come to Egypt. You can find bread. People from all over flock to Egypt. The whole, er the whole world is coming to Egypt to find bread, to be fed, to have life. And the response of Pharaoh is, go to Joseph. Go to Joseph and live Go to Joseph and eat. Go to Joseph and be saved. In all this, we can't help but wonder what would have happened. What would have happened had Joseph not been sold into slavery by his brothers? What would have happened if Joseph had not been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife? What would have happened if Joseph had not been thrown in prison for crimes he didn't commit? What would have happened if two of Pharaoh's most trusted servants were not thrown into that same prison where Joseph lay? What would have happened if Joseph had not been there to interpret their dreams? What would have happened if he had never gotten the opportunity to speak to Pharaoh about the coming famine? Probably a lot of people would have died. You see, in the great pain that Joseph faced for 13 years of his life. God was a preparing a plan to bless all the earth through Joseph. This is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in part, that through your offspring, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. But Joseph had to go through 13 years of misery, 13 years of heartache, and yet, there was not one meaningless, purposeless instance of suffering that Joseph ever endured. Not one purposeless instance of suffering. God used every last bit of it to accomplish his purposes. Joseph knew this. We see it in the way he names his sons. The names of his sons are Manasseh, having to do with God making him forget, making him forget all of his hardship that he previously endured. Ephraim, meaning that God made him fruitful. He made him, uh, he made him fruitful in the land of his affliction. We learn two things from these names. Number one, the pain Joseph faced was real. It's worth forgetting. 
He doesn't want to hold on to it. He wants to forget it and God helped him forget because it was hard. It was not fun. It was not enjoyable. But the other thing that he knew was that God used that pain for his purposes. So the question is, do you believe that he can do that with your pain this morning? Do you believe that he is doing that with your pain this morning? That he can use, he wastes nothing. We sang a song earlier. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. God wastes no suffering. He wastes no suffering. The ultimate example of this is found in Christ. In fact, I don't know if you've picked up on it, but in this passage, we see a whole lot of foreshadowing of what would happen to Christ later. Think about this. The beloved son of the father, despised by his brothers. He is a wise man in whom is the spirit of God. Scripture says Jesus Christ is wisdom personified. He is the wisdom of God sent to man. As Joseph was falsely accused, so Jesus was falsely accused. As Joseph was unjustly punished between two criminals, so Jesus was unjustly punished between two criminals. As Joseph was miraculously raised from the pit of death, so Jesus was miraculously raised from the pit of death in his resurrection, overcoming death and sin. As Joseph was exalted to the right hand of the king, so Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the father. And as Joseph stood and offered salvation to all who would come to him, as he said, come, eat the bread of Egypt, eat the bread of Joseph. As Pharaoh said, hey, go to Joseph. Well, Jesus says, come, I am the bread of life. Come to me, but this bread, I won't sell it to you. You get it for free. That's what Isaiah 55, one and two says, come all you who hunger, come buy bread without price. Come and eat, have your fill. Jesus standing there preaching to the masses says, I'm the bread of life. If you eat of this bread, you will live forever. You will live forever. Jesus, through all of his suffering, always entrusted himself to the wise providence of his heavenly father. At the cross, as he took on the sins of the world, he suffered more pain and sorrow than you and I could ever imagine. And yet he trusted, he knew that God would accomplish his purpose through Jesus' suffering. By his stripes, we are healed. And friends, if God can use the greatest injustice in human history, the murder of his son, the crucifixion of his own son, then I promise you, you can trust him with your pain. I promise you. You may not understand it. You may not get an answer, but you can trust this God with your pain. There's nothing going, in your, going on in your life this morning that has not passed through the wise, loving hand of your father God. Nothing. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we'll close with this. We know that for those who love God, all things, all things, every last thing, work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's providence. That's the providence of your God over your soul. Let's pray.